Well, Nicola Sturgeon is among world leaders who have condemned uh, what she called the utterly horrifying scenes in America where rioters stormed the US Capitol in Washington. The First Minister of Scotland said shame on those who have incited this attack on democracy. She joins us now this morning. Good morning to you, uh, Nicola Sturgeon. Thank you for joining us this morning. morning. Uh, I think we're all still reeling from what we saw yesterday uh, as, as the First Minister of Scotland, as somebody who's been involved in politics for the majority of your life. Have you managed to process what you saw? Uh, not really. You know, on one level, I think... Um, what happened last night, what we witnessed last night, is not that surprising. In some senses, Donald Trump's presidency has been moving towards this moment almost from the moment it started. But that doesn't make it any less shocking. You know, what we witnessed weren't just scenes of, you know, horrible uh, breaches of law and order, you know, people taking over the seat of democracy, but we actually witnessed the president of the United States inciting insurrection in his own country. Um, and I think for many people, it will take some time to get our heads around that. Um, thankfully, there's only a matter of days of his presidency left. And, you know, we heard Joe Biden last night remind us what uh, a real leader, a real democratic leader should, should sound like. But, you know, this has been a, a dark period in America's history, there's no doubt about it. And I would imagine many people in that country and across the world are looking forward to it coming to an end. But clearly there are deep-seated divides there that the new administration have to tackle and try to heal. Amongst the many uh, people that sort of posted on Twitter or on social media in criticism of what was happening was former President George W. Bush, uh, who mm -hmm. pointed out that he and his wife Laura were watching the scenes of may uh, uh, mayhem unfolding. And he went on to say, it's sickening and heartbreaking sight. This is how an election result is in a disputed banana republic take place, not our democratic republic. And it's an extraordinary sort of correlation that he's put there, that you're watching uh, the supporters of Donald Trump incited by the president to storm the Capitol building in order to stop the steal, as they say. These unfounded rules, every one of the yeah. lawsuits that they've bought has been thrown out. And yet nothing stopped him from this, uh, sort of issuing this rhetoric, has it? Uh, no, and you know, I think there are questions for you know social media companies. There are there are all sorts of questions, but you know, in a sense, focusing on them today takes away from where the the focus and the spotlight should be, which is on him and his conduct and his behaviour. I mean, you you quoted George W. Bush there, and in some respects, and this might sound quite glib, but you know, the fact that we look to somebody like George W. Bush, somebody that I was a huge critic of during his time mm. in office, and many people were because of the Iraq War, we now. Trump's taken the presidency so low that we now look to him as some kind of elder statesman. And, you know, we can have really deep divisions and disagreements in politics. That's the nature of democracy. But there's a, a level of decency that I think we all accept democracy depends on. And Donald Trump, you know, I think has failed to live up to that or come close to living up to that all along. But last night was undoubtedly a new low even for him. So, you know, the sooner this whole sorry episode comes to a close, I, I think the better for everybody. Well, whether they get him out before or if they wait till the week on Wednesday, as you said, he is going to go. And one of the reports is that he might come to Scotland to play golf. Uh, you've made it pretty clear that you wouldn't be welcoming him with open arms. What if he ignores your warnings? Because he's a man that often does, doesn't he? And does turn up. What will you do? Well, let me cross that bridge if and when uh, <laughs> we come to it. I mean, clearly, you know, former presidents of... Uh, the United States have, uh, I understand, uh, a degree of, of immunity when it comes to international travel, but I, I don't want to get into that right now. But uh, let me be very clear that, you know, I, I don't particularly relish having Donald Trump come to Scotland at any time, but we're in a pandemic at the moment. And uh, we are very clearly saying to people, in fact, this is underpinned in law right now in Scotland, that you should not be travelling out of the country or into the country unless you have a really essential purpose. And uh, if I can be very, very blunt about this, Donald Trump coming to Scotland to play golf is not, in my book, an essential purpose. So uh, I would ask him uh, not, uh, according to the White House, he has no plans to do that, I understand, but um, I would ask him to uh, abide by the restrictions that are in place right now to try to keep the population here here as safe as possible from COVID. Well, talking of COVID, it, it is a terrifying situation. Here we are again in another lockdown. You have your own restrictions. On Monday, you warned that the hospitals could reach full capacity within two or three weeks. Um, what would the consequences of that be? Well, the consequences of that would be 
grim. I mean, not just for people with COVID, uh, where there would be real pressure on the ability of the NHS to care for them. But, you know, let's be very clear, at a time when our hospitals are under so much pressure because of something like COVID, which doesn't happen very often, then that restricts the ability of the NHS to care for people who need them for other reasons, you know, people who might be in car accidents or who have heart attacks. If intensive care is so full with COVID patients, uh, then that obviously raises real concerns for others as well. So the pressure on our NHS in Scotland, it is coping, it is under severe pressure, but so far it is coping. Uh, but we all have a part to play to ensure that that can continue to be the case. The, the thing we can do for the NHS right now, and I think everybody always wants to help the NHS and people who work in it, but the thing we have to do right now is stay at home. Unless you have an essential purpose for being outside your own home right now, stay at home so that you are minimising any risk of getting or passing on COVID. You, you had very strict measures in place before the most recent lockdown happened, of course, and those cases continue to rise. I'm not sure we've still seen yet the impact of Christmas in terms of those figures. Are you confident that the new restrictions will bring those cases down and alleviate some of that pressure on the NHS in Scotland? So if I could be quite blunt here and say that I'm literally monitoring this, as you would expect, mm. On a daily basis, I hope that the restrictions, if people abide by them, and people have been fantastic in abiding by restrictions all along, and that's not easy. If people abide by them, then yes, I, I hope and believe we can see uh, the case rise at uh, STEM and hopefully cases start to decline. But I'm not complacent about that yet. We'll be monitoring, are monitoring traffic numbers, uh, for example, to see the extent to which uh, this lockdown is keeping people at home. There's a question in my mind about whether we need to go a bit further in restricting non-essential business activity to cut even further the reasons that people have for being outside of their own home. And that's something I'll be looking at with my advisors over the next few days. Um, what about the youngsters who are being homeschooled? Um, there's a lot of concern from parents who are struggling anyway with yet another batch of homeschooling. What are you making, how are you making sure in Scotland that the most vulnerable youngsters have got the support they need? Well, firstly, this is a, a matter of deep concern to all of us. I, you know, of, of all of the restrictions we're having to put in place right now, closing schools has been this time the last resort, and we're only doing it because we think it is absolutely essential and won't keep schools closed for a moment longer than is necessary. We've done a, a number of things and we'll continue to work very hard to try to further improve the online provision. Uh, over the past few months, we've distributed uh, with the in partnership with local authorities in Scotland uh, electronic devices you know, iPads, uh, laptops and things like that to young people in the most deprived communities so that physically they are able to get online. There's been a lot of work led by Education Scotland uh, to make sure that the, the courses, the, the material, the substance of the provision online is of good quality. And that work continues with Education Scotland, local authorities, individual schools. This is incredibly difficult for parents. I mean, I am not a parent, so I don't know what it's like to to juggle working life with childcare and, and homeschooling, but I know it's really difficult and we've got a duty to do everything we can to help. What about vaccines? Boris Johnson made the yeah. comment that if it was left to your... Because they're the hope, aren't they? They're the hope and there's a new one being rolled out today. Um, Boris Johnson made the comment that if it had been left to you and the SNP, there wouldn't be a vaccine because it's the clout of the United Kingdom that's been able to deliver it. And to be fair, compared with, for instance, the EU, we have been able to pass and deliver vaccines more quickly. Well, look, that's a pretty juvenile comment at a time when I think everybody wants to see grown-ups in charge of this uh, response to COVID. What happens in the UK is that the four nations, Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland, we voluntarily agree to procure vaccines collectively because we think that gets us a better crack of the whip than doing it individually. It's a choice we make. Uh, we do it for the flu vaccine, we're doing it for the COVID vaccine. That does not mean Scotland, if it chose to do it differently, couldn't procure vaccines. We are being sensible and grown up about it and choosing uh, to do it this way because we think I that makes sense. The point Scotland... is, is your, the, your for a union when it works for you, but not necessarily well, all time. I guess that's the point he's making, it works, isn't it? it works the point I was going to make is it works for all of us. The independent countries of the European Union pull together to do certain things. That's 
uh, sensible. And the point I was going to make, if Scotland was independent, when Scotland is independent, as I think it, it will be, then there are certain things that we, it would still make sense to come together to do. That's how the modern interconnected internationalist world works. And more generally, though, right now, this is the biggest challenge people like me and Boris Johnson and leaders across the world have faced. We should be trying to cooperate and work together. And, you know, I'm not perfect. I indulge in politics at times. I'm a politician, so I'm not trying to take a holier-than-thou attitude. But let's just make more of an effort when people are suffering so much right now to, to rise above these, frankly, juvenile comments uh, and try to, to raise our games. OK, let's come back to the vaccines then briefly, if we may. I think originally the target that you had set was to have a million people vaccinated in Scotland mm -hmm. by the end of January. Where are you with that target? Are you still confident that you can make that happen? Well, it's dependent on supply. So we, at the moment, um, and we've been quite cautious in what we are saying, only given commitments that we think we can absolutely rely on, we think we will have by the end of January uh, just over 900,000 doses of the vaccine. So, you know, it's slightly below that million, but hopefully it will get closer to that as, as the supplies uh, become a bit firmer over the next days and, and weeks. Uh, the vaccination programme is well underway. Uh, we've There'll be up-to-date figures published later today, which I obviously can't uh, go into because they're official statistics, but, you know, we are well over 100,000 people vaccinated right now. The community uh, provision has got underway earlier this week. There are new GP practices uh, coming on stream today with that, and that will scale up uh, across the country from Monday. Um, so I I'm not complacent about this. This is a massive logistical exercise, but it is so important that it is something that has the 100% focus of me and my government right now. We need to vaccinate people just as quickly as we get supplies coming through. Yeah. It is the hope we're all holding on to, undoubtedly. Nicola Sturgeon, thank you for joining us this morning.